Right here. Oh, I don't know if we want to use my phone. What's going on, everybody? Um, well, <laughs> sorry, dude. I was looking at the screen there. <laughs> What's going on? Welcome to Eastern Current. I am Judson Brock. I've got Cameron Pappas beside me, Billy Thorpe, my other side. And forgive forgive me right now if I screw this up. I'm going to be doing the switching and changing of the episode of the scenes and whatnot. And and so if I if I mess it up big time, just just be patient. I'll get better. I'll you get got better it, man. So you're uh, the man. What episode is this? Episode twenty six. Twenty six. And we're going to be talking about uh, targeting, you know, schools of redfish in the winter. So when things are changing up, uh, you know, water temperature wise and, and daylight time wise, how, how much daylight we have during the day, the fish start to really change with their patterns. And um, sometimes, you know, you, you stumble onto these big schools of fish. Other times you're like, where did all my fish go? Where are the fish that I'm catching um, a month ago? Where are they now? So we're going to dive into that, talk about tactics, talk about different lures to fish, you know, how to approach these fish. Um, how to successfully, you know, be able to come back to these fish time after time and 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 catch a few and 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 leave them alone. So <laughs> I just want to sing that song time after time. time I think uh, that was a pre-show song that we're and you're singing actually. Oh really? <laughs> we were playing around big time. So uh, Cameron, that was your cue to sing time after oh, yeah, time yeah, yeah, like yeah, you yeah, were yeah, early. You guys ready? Yep. <laughs> <laughs> so I've got some sad news. Um, this will be Billy. Why don't you take it away? Oh man, I'm retiring. Billy, I'm retiring Billy's from retiring. Eastern Current. This is my last episode. I don't think any of those cameras can see me. Maybe they can see no, my they face. No, they got you. We're, you're on. Perfect. So appreciate all you guys. I love you. Judson kicked me out, said I couldn't be on the show. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> he just um, never wore deodorant. And I just, just, just yeah, man. next to him for an hour every day. Never wore deodorant. I was late all the time, slacking, didn't get stuff. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, no, man. So gonna going to focus on my business, Thorpe Creative. going to focus on uh, real estate as well. So yeah. kind of doing that dual career thing. And, um, and, and yeah, man, so that's good. But I am going to continue podcasting. It's just not going to be a live show, and it's not going to be about fishing. Yeah. So probably no, f- probably no one listening is going to be interested, but no, it, it'll be a no, business I think show. It'll be so. real interesting. Yeah, talk a little bit about that. Yeah, so, I mean, basically the, the you know the, high, the whole idea is we get the studio space, my friend Michael from Michael Escobar Photography and I, and so we decided, like, hey, we you know he's going to create some podcasts in here, and I'm going to create yeah. – a business podcast where I bring entrepreneurs in and business owners and really just talk about their journey, talk about how they, you know, got from point A to point B. And, you know, and and there's just, if you're an entrepreneur like me and you like love starting businesses, there's just a lot of hype around being an entrepreneur. And so to really bring that down to the average guy that's going, Hey, you know, I want to, I want to be inspired to do this. That's the whole purpose of that podcast. So we just kept the same name. So it's Thorpe creative entrepreneur podcast. It's on iTunes. Stitcher, all those fun yeah. places. So, yeah, man, we got our first episode out, and um, and so, yeah, I'm just gonna keep doing it, and it won't be a live show. It'll be maybe weekly. We'll just see what my time yeah, restraints look for like. Sure. 
I have to keep a hobby that doesn't make money. So <laughs> <laughs> my wife's like, you're going to need to keep doing something and you love podcasting. And I got all this stuff. So yeah, what am I going to do with it? Right. So Billy, Billy went, went head over heels with, with all that. I went ham together. on this Eastern current thing when we first got started, man. And so, so now that he's leaving, I'm like having to learn all this tech stuff real quick. And so hopefully it'll, I'll learn it. I'll, it'll probably be a little, a little scratchy here at first, but, but I think dude, you can figure it out. You'll do fine, man. And I think, you know, handing off to Cameron and you guys are, he, he's going to co-host yeah, with you, right? So, with me. Uh, I didn't know if I was supposed to let that out of the bag or no, not, but that, I sure did. That's the, that's the news. That's the big news. Um, so dude, this, it's going to fall, but anyway, <laughs> <laughs> so, just hold the whole thing like this. So yeah, man, I think having two people on the show that are really passionate about fishing, that really know fishing and, and, and can really, you know, dive into it deep and give the audience more of that. Um, you know, I think that's what you guys will, will do really great at really excited to see where the show goes. And, um, you know, and I know a different person and I'll come back on, I'll come back on sometimes yeah, you, and, you definitely will. and just ask weird questions and make dumb jokes. Cause that's what I do. <laughs> um, but yeah, man, so I'm excited for the next step and I'm, I'm excited for you too, man. I'm excited for you to take Eastern current and run with it and, you know, grow a brand uh, in the fishing industry. I know that was a, a passion of yours when we started. So I'm, I'm happy. Everybody's happy, and, and yeah, this is all good. I think it'll, I think it'll go good. You'll be missed, and uh, your expertise, your techie expertise and nerdiness, will be, uh, will, will show that that I don't have the yeah. same expertise. But hopefully, we'll uh, we'll get to that point. Um, but yeah, so we're excited to bring. I'm excited to bring Cameron on as the as the new co-host, and hopefully, he won't blow it tonight. Tonight's going to be his <laughs> test. Yeah, if I blow it tonight, I'm out. Man. Well, I'm going to ask you one question, and you've got to talk for the next hour about that one question. And if you can do it, you got the job. I'm just kidding. If that's the case, we should all just shut down and leave. Right? <laughs> yeah. Exactly. But yeah, Cameron. Uh, Cameron's a good buddy of mine. We fish together a lot. Um, he's real passionate. He's got a camera that we can use, so it just worked out really well. I'm pretty much just using just it for using his camera. Me for my camera. I think. <laughs> no, he's got just, a computer. He's got a new laptop and a camera. I don't have the computer skills. I can promise you that. Oh man, you're a gamer, aren't you? We're gonna, we're gonna the files are in the computer. <laughs> Start banging on it. <laughs> Get out of this computer. <laughs> but yeah, so so things are changing up a little bit, but but we're excited and we're gonna we're gonna run hard with this Eastern Current thing. Keep doing yeah. the live shows. Keep doing the podcast. Keep up to youtube and so you guys keep ordering shirts and hats and i'll keep printing those yeah definitely, yeah, definitely. So, it'll be good. um i think that uh i think it'll be good well well you'll be missed but it'll be good so people are already saying gonna miss you billy gonna miss you billy it's all right go follow my <laughs> podcast you won't miss me for much longer that's true <laughs> and you'll you'll get to see billy in his in his natural habit you'll see talking me business talking business talking maybe business. yeah we'll see another uh, good luck good. billy going to miss you on the show so Oh, Cliff, man. He's he's my number one guy, man. Cliff's he, the man. He's been here since day one. We're going to probably lose all our listeners when you're gone. Hey, you know what? That's right. That's part of it, man. That's <laughs> part of it. Blame it on me. Yeah. Right. <laughs> on Cameron. Y'all might get to like Cameron. I liked him pretty quick. He took, I mean, it took some, <laughs> some warming up, too. When I first met him, I was like, this guy is a loser. <laughs> what is this guy doing? Um, no, I'm just that's kidding. That's most people's Well, hey, you got, I mean, you guys are twinning on the hat, so that's a good step in yeah. the right direction. I want to say he copied, he copied me. There we go. Well, that's, oh, <laughs> we'll never wear my hat like that. Well, cool. Well, let's jump into it. Let's uh, we'll go over the sponsors real quick. That is, uh, we got Ice Strike Fishing. Dave and Ralph over at Ice Strike have done a lot with us and um, good buddies of ours. And um, we got some cool stuff in the works. I was on the phone with Dave today um, about that re uh, release over twenty. Oh and, yeah. And there's going to be some cool stuff coming up about that for um the 2020 but I, that's all i'm going to share and and we'll uh we'll come back i know uh, a guy that does stickers just gonna say that oh this we, show is going to be all about just promoting my business <laughs> no i'm just kidding he's the sticker guy he's the hat guy uh, but yeah dave and I, dave and ralph at i strike awesome dudes create uh some incredible products if you're not already fishing their jigs and uh their other kind of hook weighted hook deal they're what's the the jail bait and the uh they make a shrimp hook for the z-man shrimp they just got a lot of cool um you know good stuff to have in your tackle box i'm i'm so nervous right now because i've got to switch all these scenes i'm like stumbling <laughs> over my words um cito don't be caught without them um don't hit a sandbar without cito that's all i gotta say afco and marshware two great clothing companies um that that have really supported the show and then they got it they're they're uh just some cool dudes eastern angling that's my business and then thorpe creative that's billy's business ct custom lures our buddy here in town that ties awesome flies and uh makes some incredible lures um, bass, bass jigs and all kinds of other stuff. And then KBT Realty, which is Billy's Realty Group, um, selling houses and uh, making that big money. Making. <laughs> <laughs> I'm that guy. I feel like that guy that just like opens up his jacket. Like, what do you need? I got it. <laughs> <laughs> I got everything you need right here. Watches and candy yeah, bars. Yeah, watches and candy bars. 
Well, cool. Well, let's jump into our our topic for the night, which is like I was saying, uh, you know, targeting these these schooling winter redfish, and it can be frustrating this time of year. And and you know, the amount of time you get to put on the water definitely helps. You know, finding spots and locating new areas to fish, and uh, these fish change up big time this time of year. Do you you want to jump in, camera, kind of, and, and we'll kind of bounce back and forth talking about you know, kind of the changes from summer, you know, and fall patterns sure. into that, that hard winter pattern? Yeah, I mean, so summer is always fish seem more spread out for the most part. Yeah. You can always find a random school sometime in the summer, but, you know, a lot of summer is throwing top waters, um, dirtier water. Yeah. And, you know, as you get into winter, I just, you know, they start congregating more and getting you know, in big schools. Yeah. And, which is a good thing and a bad thing because when, when they're when it's summer you have a good chance of catching redfish kind of anywhere. Yeah, um, definitely. And in in the winter, if you don't know where fish are, you can spend a lot of time uh, searching for them. Yeah. But the good thing is, is once you find them, uh, you usually find a lot of them. Yeah. And it's it's nice once you find them, just because you can. It, generally, they don't leave that area. So if you find a school in the winter. Don't tell anybody because <laughs> <laughs> they're probably not going to leave um, unless they get over pressured. Yeah. Um, and yeah, I mean, so it is a big change and you just kind of got to do a lot of exploring in the winter, I would say. Um, and, you know, yeah. I think one of the frustrating things, too, in the winter is like there's no unknown. Like if you're pulling your boat around or trolling motoring in the creeks, it's so clear. That there's no like, oh, I'm going to just blind cast this uh, spoon and see if I pick anything up. You know? Yeah, I, I very rarely yeah. blind cast in the winter um, unless I'm fishing docks or something like that. For sure. And you say it's because the water is a little more clear? It's in so the clear time. you can just see everything. So if you're pulling through an area or you're trolling motoring through an area or drifting through an area, uh, you know, yeah. trying to locate gotcha. fish. It's, I mean, it, it's, if it's real deep and you can't really see the bottom, you know, it's good to fish, but I mean, you can pretty much always tell if there's fish there. Or not. Then I wonder what makes the water clear versus the dirty water in the summer. I could be slightly wrong about this, but it, it's like a temperature threshold. So that uh, you get a lot of gotcha. this algae bloom uh, gotcha. um, when the water's a little bit warmer. And so once it gets, I think it's like 65, yeah. a lot of those little micro algae start to die off. And so mm -hmm. the water gets really clear. So I'm going to assume that redfish, if you can see, if we can see them better, they probably see yeah, They're probably for school sure. enough for protection purposes, yeah. maybe. They can definitely see see you better, and and they can feel you better um, as well. But it's surprising. I, I did a test one time and got in the water, in pretty clear water, and like I was a fish, looking back up at my skiff. <laughs> and I was I had my peck fins out and everything. Yeah. But you really can't see boats that well. It maybe At least I couldn't. I put goggles on and everything and was just trying to get a perspective of like approaching fish in clear water. Like, what are they seeing? And you can see fish now, are also this is made to out. see underwater. <laughs> they are made to humans are not. But but that that like that, the, I guess it's the light and the way it works. You know, looking up at something that's on the surface, especially a skiff that barely enters the yeah. water. You know, it's really hard to see it. You can see out of the water and see like movement up above the water, but that boat is pretty hard to pick up on. So I'm gonna have to figure yeah. this out, man. I'm gonna make some fish eye goggles that like replicate what a fish eyeball does in the today. water that's your new that's another new and then everybody player. can just get in the water like you just see a bunch of fishermen just swimming around like <laughs> trying to figure out what fish are doing they're like all right this feels like a good spot to hang out as a flounder so hold on so you jumped in the water with a pair of goggles on so you would get a perspective of no, fish you no goggles right no no i had goggles oh, okay. i put goggles oh. on. i was like this i couldn't really see anything i figured all right i'm good I, was say, man, I don't know you saw anything no it it, it was uh eye-opening <laughs> <laughs> no, but it was it, it, it. I mean, I don't know how true it was. You know, yeah. I don't know if fish could see better, but I mean, I could see really well. I could see really far on the water, and the boat just kind of disappears on that surface line of the water. Oh, yeah. But I could see, like, I had my buddy on the bow, and I could see him moving around, acting like he was casting and whatnot. And that, that I think, is what's going to spook those fish a lot more in the winter. Oh, uh, gotcha. Than actually the boat being all that close to him. I mean, you want to stay back as far as you can, but. But that's that's we'll get into that whole the whole topic about approach and whatnot. But yeah, we're talking about these fish and 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 like Cameron said, it's like in the summer they're real spread out, you know, and you you have a really good chance at like working a broader area and still getting a bite. But in the winter, if you're not throwing where that group of fish is, there's really not many singles and doubles spread out in an area. They're all kind yeah, of wadded I mean, up, and especially if you're fishing shallow water. Yeah, definitely. Um, because you could be throwing and being like, oh well, maybe I'll catch a trout, but. Yeah. You know, if you're not seeing any fish whatsoever, chances are there's not 
any fish around you. yeah that's that's the and, and like like you were saying it's like that's the nice thing you know they're not there but also it's kind of a bummer when you spend a whole day running around yeah. checking spots and you don't see anything oh, um damn. but but yeah so what i kind of look at is what's an area that i've been catching fish in the summertime you know oh, a, yeah, that, was, a, that was my next question yeah like yeah. A, a general area and, and and i look for a spot where these fish have a deeper area to pull off to they'll still get shallow as a school you know you're not going to really see singles or doubles break off that school and get shallow they're going to all swim together like a school of mullet for the most part but there'll, there'll be areas where they'll they'll they, they want to be able to get up on the flats and up in the shallow stuff yeah. but they also want to be able to pull off during those big weather changes and sit in a deeper hole um in some areas they'll just sit in those deeper spots the whole time so um i, I if i'm like if i hop on google earth and i'm scrolling around like i always do this this time of year trying to find new spots and i scroll around and i just look for those dark green patches of water you know where there's some flats let me around. look at my phone since my last episode let's talk about some of these spots <laughs> let's do it let's do it um but yeah you just want to find an area that that gives them all that they need the shallow flats oysters are always pretty key i feel like too. bait bait will hold around oysters in the winter it holds heat water's a little bit warmer um and like cameron said they're creatures of habit they're going to be in the same spots over and over again so um maybe we can talk a little bit cameron about kind of how to take care of these schools of redfish. I know we, we, we talked about it on that audio podcast we did sure. um, a few weeks ago, but, but kind of like, all right, you find a school of fish. Actually, let's talk about, we'll, we'll talk about that at the end. Let's talk about like the approach to these fish, right? You've located some fish and like, what's the, what's the best way to, to target these fish once you've figured out where they are. First steps, make sure they're not mullet. Yeah, <laughs> that's true. Well, actually yesterday we were chasing a school of redfish and hooked times. a big mullet. Yeah. Yeah. Because I don't know the, if, if this might just be me, but, Generally, the schools of redfish that I find in the winter are, are smaller fish. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, you can tell once you get pretty close to them if they're mullet or redfish. But, I mean, mullet will get in these huge schools, too. And they'll push wakes and, and whatnot. And you're like, oh, man, there's a huge school of yeah. redfish. And you're, like, pulling up on them. And they're all darty. And you finally get a good look at one. And you're like, oh, I just spent four hours <laughs> chasing this school of mullet. Uh, yeah, it's, um, uh, it's defeating. Yeah, but, I, I mean, I think a slow approach is definitely always key, um, whether you're trolling motoring or, or pulling your boat. Um, and one thing I always uh, can sometimes frustrate me is if I'm fishing with someone that maybe hasn't fished a school of redfish yeah. that many times, and they're up on the front of the boat, and they're stomping around, and I'm like, why should we stop them? Oh, yeah. <laughs> stop stomping around, though, because they're so sensitive. I mean, that's in the summer, too, if you're on a school oh, of for fish. Sure. but. Shallow feel, water fish in yeah, general. Yeah, I just feel like more so in the winter when the water's really clear. But, I mean, I think um, the placement of your cast is, is super important. Yeah. Um, you don't want to throw right in the middle of a school of redfish. Because no, definitely you not. Because blow them up. It seems to spook them. Um, so, I, I mean, you always want to lead the front fish by a couple feet. Yeah. Um, and just I, I tend to work my baits a little bit slower yeah in the sure. winter um even to the point where it, it might not even be suspending in the water yeah like it yeah I, I swear you can just sit it on the bottom and just give it a teeny little twitch and if they see any sort of movement on the bottom they'll leave it yeah i'd agree with that yeah uh, i agree i concur you concur <laughs> it's uh yeah it can be a little frustrating sometimes to let me switch back over there we go <laughs> It can be a little frustrating sometimes, you know, when you're on those fish, how spooky they get. They, there's so many fish together. You spook one fish, just like a school of mullet, like when you're chasing them with a cast net and like your a cast net weight hits the boat when they're coming at you and one twitches and the whole school, you know, freaks out. Um, you're going to spook that whole school. The whole school is going to react with that one fish. And I do want to add something to um, a good way to tell if they're mullet or redfish. Yeah. If, if redfish are actively feeding, they'll turn on their sides a yep. lot. And it's, I call it winking, yeah. which I, I got from somebody. But they'll turn winking on their sides flashing. and you kind of just see these flashes of white or silver. Mm -hmm. And it's like, if they're doing that, you know that they're feeding on something. Yeah. yeah. Um, which generally means if you get a good cast in there, you have a good chance of hooking up with them. Definitely. And a lot of times this time of year, what they're feeding on is small little baits, little tiny glassy like minnows. Fry. So, yeah, you'll just see that little flash because it's not like they're chasing down a bait fish. They're just kind of rolling and eating it. And it's been talked about. Like some, I think sometimes they'll just do that without eating too. They'll just kind of roll because I've been looking at a school before and like seen a fish just roll and mouth. I mean, I couldn't. I wasn't inches away to tell, but it didn't really look like the mouth opened. But maybe if it's eating a small bait, 
the mouth doesn't have to open much. But no, yeah, that, there's 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 key key ways to figure that out too. And mullet, I feel like, and and in the winter they do act a lot more like redfish. They're a little mm-hmm. slower. They don't wake off as much, but they are a little more spastic than than redfish. Like if you if you bump a school of redfish, it's usually going to be a pretty steady push away from the boat. More, mullet are more. Um... What it, horizontal yeah, pushes. Yeah, definitely. Like wake, then uh, mullet are more... V, yeah, but tight V-ish. And they yeah. cut. They go back and forth a lot. It's not yeah. like one set direction, it feels mm-hmm. like. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it's... It, it's. I mean, any, another way to find out, too, is throw in there and if you get a bite, you know, if, if you can't really tell. But um, uh, one thing to think about, too, like like Cameron was talking about the, uh, the casting and, and the leading of the fish. Like, if it's a small school... You can you can you can stay pretty tight to them, but like on those bigger schools when they're spooky, sometimes I'll throw out there, you know, ten feet in front of them. Oh yeah, and let Definitely. it sink all the way down to the bottom, and let it sit there, and let part of the school go ahead and get over the bait without moving it, and then start moving it once it's back in the school. If you get into those fish that are in the middle of the school, I feel like they're usually a lot more likely to eat out of a spooky school. They yeah. they got all their buddies around them, they're a little more confident. But if, like you were saying, if you throw right into the middle, you're going to blow the whole school up. I don't care if it, even if it's four or five feet of water, sometimes you'll, you'll spook them. Oh, definitely. Mm. The other thing too, like if you see a big school coming down and you're in like a somewhat of a narrow Creek and there's not a ton of oysters on the bank and it's a lower tide. Yeah. Sometimes they'll just spook off. Even if you cast five feet in front of them, they'll just spook off the splash. Yeah. And, and if they're that spooky, you gotta like, just think of other ways to try and not spook them. Um, so sometimes I'll try and throw like into the bank if there's like any exposed sand or mud or anything and throw into yep. that and then just yeah, that's slowly drag it into the water. Hmm. Definitely. Yeah. The, the sneaker you can be with getting the, the bait in there, the better that's for sure. So, um, let's see, John said, D, uh, define deep slash shallow is deep 15 feet or six feet. And that really depends on your, on, on the place you're at. Like those fish, I, I think, you know, when I say they want a deep hole, I think they want something that at low tide is going to give them at least, you three, know, three to three to six feet yeah, of water. Yeah. And, and sometimes it's holes that are, you know, 10 feet, 12 feet deep, but um, not always. But they, they just want something that they can fall back into when everything else dries up as well as when they get a big temperature change. And some of those spots, if you can find a deep hole that um, that's holding fish and uh, and you can get back to it, because that's one of the problems with, like, like, like with a lot of these winter schooling fish is the best time to fish them is low tide. Yeah. Well, like, you might not be able to get back to this hole in the marsh at low tide, even if you got a boat that drafts six inches. Yeah. Yeah. And that's a t- lot of the spots. I've, I mean, I've walked back to spots yeah. in, you know, knee high mud just to get to this hole. And it's like one of the most fun things because oh, you know, yeah. fishing for redfish from the bank. Yeah, dude. It's really I- I've heard a lot of stories about guys that, that will do that. We'll go find holes that are on low tide, just like a deep hole somewhere in the back and, and just walk back there and just light them up. Like se- like one guy told me he caught like 75 red drum. Yeah. <laughs> a redfish. I was like. In one hole, he's like, dude, it was like fishing out of a pond. Yeah, like, it, was it can amazing. be like that. It can really be like that where you can just... I guess they just got trapped in there? Yeah. Or the, the, whatever? Well, they just they choose get, to stay in, in the hole? That's and... like their safety spot. They want to, They just they live in these little micro areas during the winter. I'm getting a drone. I'm going to find them. <laughs> Don't talk about that secret. <laughs> That's another great way to find them as a drone. Um, but it, it's a $1,000 way to find them. We're now like $1,500. And it's way to not... Find them. I mean, the times that I've been with someone who's had a drone and looked for him, you're like, oh, there's a big school. And you're like, and you go back and t- t- try and fish him, and you're like, oh, nope, that's 200 mullet. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> the drone is really nice when you, like, you already know some areas that these fish should be. Yeah. And you go out at low tide when you can't get to those areas, but you just pop it up, fly it around a little bit, locate some of these fish. Um, and the, But the drone will spook them too. And that's one thing that, that we need to talk about that's like, you know, we have this opportunity this time of year to really crush these fish and catch a lot of redfish, but it's so important to not beat up on them too much. One, just for the sake of like, all right, you know, I can sit here and catch five or six, or I could sit here and catch 60, but why catch that many fish out of one spot? You know, they're there. There's, I mean, I get it, but yeah. what, what is it to sit there 
and catch you know 50 fish out of one spot when you're just making a cast and you're not doing anything i mean it's fun to catch fish but it feels really good from the guy who fishes every day <laughs> yeah, I know. for the rest of us it's, yeah, it's right. easy for me to I say don't i care. guess but <laughs> yeah, right. i'm just kidding no i'm with you but it does feel really good to walk away from them you know what i mean yeah. you're, you're catching them good and be like all right i've all caught right. 10 fish i'll catch 55 <laughs> I'll let them I'm just yeah i'm a big believer in that just because chances are someone else is fishing them too Yep, and um, you know you want to come back and fish them as well, and the more that they get pounded, just the less they're likely to eat. Oh yeah, or or, you know eat artificial baits. Yeah. So I mean, that's true. If I want to, if if I know of a school in the winter, um, I'll go try and catch a handful of fish out of them and then leave them alone, just because. I want to come back next weekend Definitely. and fish them again and hopefully have the same luck. Yeah, yeah for th- sure. Th- I was going to make a comment about gill nets, and then I was like, no, nah, I'm not going to. I'll, I'll play nice. And then somebody's like, how do you feel about gill nets? He's thinking of starting a petition. Because I, I was going to make a joke, be like, oh, either we beat them up or the gill net guys get them. Like, yeah. But I, then he brought that up. So, Tyler, more power to you, brother. Go start that petition. Yeah, we would Take love, care of the let resource. Let know how it goes. We're all about it. Um, but yeah, it's, it, that's the thing too. And, and like, I have been on the boat with my clients and had another boat get near us that I could tell, I, I know these people don't know where these fish are, but they're kind of poking around. And I have laid down on my boat <laughs> with my clients. We all lay down. Like, we're going to just take a little snack and take a little break, have a snack, have a drink and, and let this boat pass. <laughs> But, I mean, if if you're just sitting there pulling back and forth, back and forth casting, and someone's watching yeah. you do it, they're like, all right, that dude, yeah. that dude is either an idiot or he's on to something. Uh, but if you see me, I'm an idiot. I'm never on to anything. But, but, um, I, just, I just have this image in my mind, like, Joe's like, all right, this come guy's on, right now, put your head get right down, here on my shoulder. It's nap time. <laughs> <laughs> you guys got a fish on. He's like, what? <laughs> you guys want some puffs? That's a that's a really good baby snack, by the way, is puffs. So you guys want some puffs? <laughs> Take a nap. Puffs and a banana. Wait, no bananas on the boat. But yeah, it's uh, you got to take care of them, man. Like it, it, It's crazy. Right now, most of those schools of fish, I mean, they're chewing really good. They're real hungry. You can bump them 50 times if you have, if you like by accident, and they'll still keep eating. But come February, when those same groups of fish are still sitting there in the marsh, and you roll in there, and your and your boat rocks and throws a tiny wake onto that school, they'll spook out. and they won't yeah. eat at mm. all. You know, yeah, it's, yeah, you there's some there's a specific group of fish a little south of of Wilmington that that happened to that they just got so worked over and mm-hmm. over, and, it, and they'd stay in the spot. And it was probably how many fish do you think that was? Five hundred fish. Well, it started out as like five hundred, yeah, and then. Um, it was super weird. That school was there for like 12 months. Yeah, they were there forever. Um, and they just progressively got smaller and smaller and smaller and uh, eventually got down to probably 80 to 50 fish and just like would not. We I was At one point, I tried throwing cut shrimp to them. Wow. And they wouldn't even eat that. Sight fishing with cut shrimp. Yeah. That's when you I mean, know you're, you're, at, you're at the bottom. Now, dude, I've seen some videos out there talking about big schools of red, red yep. fish. And, you know, these are more like Florida guys and, and whatever, but they're mm-hmm. like out in the, well, I think what was the ocean fly fishing for them. Yep. Is that something that happens in this area up this far or not really? It, it happens in North Carolina, but not so much where we live, but like oh, out, gotcha. out up in the uh, in the Outer Banks. I knew you were going to say that. Everything yeah, happens yeah. in the Outer Banks. I know, it's man. the land of giants. It man. is they, the land they of they giants. Like the, they got everything. Yeah. Of course, I guess when you're, what, 30, 40 miles further out in the ocean than right. we are, yeah. maybe a little more action happens. Um, no, I've uh, I've had the opportunity to go up there a couple of times and, and fish for those. And with Matt, you fish with Matt Lusk, right? With Matt Lusk, mm-hmm. yeah. I mean, we uh, you pull up on, uh, you're like 500 yards off the beach, and you pull up on a, a school of like thousands and thousands of bull redfish. Yeah. And, and that... You do not have to lead any fish. You just <laughs> no. throw it right, throw it right in the middle of them. And they're eating it as soon as it, yeah. Eaten. yeah. And that's the same thing with the ones in the marsh too. When they're unpressured, I mean, you can usually throw a jig right in there. They might spook like a couple inches and then come right over and eat the jig immediately. Wow. Um, but but yeah, I mean, we get some schools of big redfish off the beach, and we get schools of slot redfish off the beach. But those big migratory schools, as well as our cobia, if you look at North Carolina on a map, we're at uh, Wilmington's in what's called Onslow Bay. And so it's this, you've got, you know, you've got bald head, you've got the, the um, shoals down there that kind of kick out to a point, Cape Fear, and then you've got Cape Lookout. And, you know, everything else dips in between those two. So a lot of those fish travel point to point. You know, they're, they're, it's oh, the easiest, quickest gotcha. way. Yeah. So 
Um, I mean, I've, I've, I've stumbled into big groups of redfish off the beach, but it's not something like in out the outer banks, you can go target them. Yeah. Here it's like, oh, you're running around and oh, yeah, shoot, if you, there's if you a. you tried to target them no, around you here couldn't. just trying to go catch big schools of redfish, like floating. Yeah. Uh, you would maybe have one successful day every year. <laughs> yeah. If, if that. Wow. If that. If you were fishing like all the time. Yeah. And, and that's just, it, always keep your eyes out, especially in the fall, you know, for those. Oh, yeah. Big... If you're, if you're out there fall salvacore fishing. I've seen I've seen one group of them fall salvacore fishing, but only once. Yeah, and yeah. I I won a bunch. Yeah, you got uh you got broke off by somebody, didn't you? So you yeah. hooked a big one and somebody threw over you. It's a uh, is it Oscar? It, 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 oh. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Oscar I just see Valentine. I just see sweat start beating up on his head, <laughs> like thinking about it. <laughs> oh man. Uh-huh. But th- that brings me to another thought of like you know all right, so we've got a lot of schools of redfish in the marsh right now. But a lot of the fish this time of year are smaller fish. So they're the, you know, 15, and, and you'll see bigger fish in there too, but 15 to like 17, 18 inches. Um, some, some you know, below slot and some barely slot fish. Um, and, and a lot of the bigger fish this time of year will pull off and sit in the inlets and sit on the beach and sit on the near shore wrecks. Um, and that's another area where if you have the ability to get out there on an ice calm day and sight fish off the beach and the breakers, or if it's really nice, no breakers. I mean, it's, sometimes it's like a lake out there in the winter. Those can be some pretty silly days. Um, and, and, and we were talking about, you know, you can the, – these schools of redfish in the ocean and then in Louisiana and Florida, even if they're still shallow water redfish, a lot of those places, those fish are much more transient. So they're moving, you know, they're working a flat, they're falling off into a channel, going – you know, they're traveling a lot more. These fish that we have here in the winter in the marsh – they're not moving. They're the same fish day after day in that spot. And so um, th- that that's why it's so much more important to, you know, not, not beat on them too hard. Um, and it's hard to do. It's very hard to be catching a lot of fish and then decide, all right, I'm going to walk away. Um, but but you got to. Uh, Cameron's, Cameron's had some pretty awesome days. You want to touch on the sight fishing in the in the ocean a little bit for redfish? Oh, yeah, redfish? yeah, sure. Um, so, yeah, I mean, at least in the boat that I have, um, it does have to be extremely, extremely calm yeah. to try and go out there and do it. But, uh, I mean, if you get a good, um, North wind, I don't know why, but that seems to make the water a little bit clearer in the ocean. Um, you can just go up and down the beach. And if you're lucky, you find like just a big black cloud right up against yeah. the sand. Um, man, it can, it, it can be a huge school of redfish and generally those are bigger than the ones that are in the marsh this time of year. Um, but, you know, you know, not bulls, but, you know, good slot redfish. Yeah. And, I mean, like in in the thousands. Yeah, they can be big old schools. Yeah. And they're, yeah. they're you know, they're kind of doing the same thing. And I think, and I, I can't prove this, but I think a lot of those fish, the bigger ones that are in the ocean, I think they're kind of trading, you know, back and forth between the near shore wrecks and the beaches. And, and, and sometimes you'll find them as it, sitting 10 feet off the sand, you know, on a calm day, like right off the beach. And other days they'll be sitting on exterior sandbars or out on shoals and whatnot. And they move around a little bit more than they do in the marsh for sure. But, but that's a really cool way to fish for them. Um, and elevation definitely helps. I've got a boat with a tower on it. so you can see those fish from a long ways away. But you just got to be careful out there, especially when it's swelly. It's very easy to get focused on looking at some fish and a wave roll in and flip your boat right down the beach. And yeah, so dang. it's a little more, it's a little more, uh, uh, you know, high risk. A little more rugged out there. Your head's rugged, man. Yeah, really that's crazy. Rugged. I don't know why. Um, this is totally speculation, but I feel like the the redfish uh, in the backwaters in the marsh, or the smaller fish, are more maybe um, okay with like water changes uh-huh. water temperature changes yeah. like more uh, intense water temperature changes because our you know our winters like you can have a day that's 32 and then the next day it's like 70 right and so the the water in the marsh changes a lot quicker than the water in the ocean and maybe those fish that those slot red fish want more even kill temperatures yeah that's and a so good that's point maybe why they push out into the ocean for sure it's uh it's another thing too that you'll see uh, inshore is you, you'll have, let's say there's a school of 300 fish and let's say 75% of them are, you know, the smaller fish. And then usually you've got some big fish in there too. And those big fish will eat. They really will eat, but it is so hard to catch them because those little guys are so much more aggressive and there's more of them, but you'll throw in there, you know, try to throw right in front and bring it in front of a big fish and you're like twitching it and he starts to look at it. And then the little guy just darts out, darts out there and eats it. <laughs> Forgot to get a mic in front of me, but, um, 
let, let's talk a little bit about uh, some of the stuff you like to throw to these fish in the winter. Okay. Uh, yeah. As far as your, your tackle goes. I like to throw a football, too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, I, I mean, it depends on water clarity, but uh, generally since the water's clear, I like to throw a little more translucent yeah. soft plastics. Um, and I, I like to fish a lot of shallow water, so I use lighter jig heads, you know, like an eighth of an ounce to a sixteenth sure. of an ounce. Um, and, you, you know, working it slowly for sure. But uh, And then do we want to talk about flies? Yeah, we can definitely talk about flies. I think um, that's a I think that's a great way to target them when it's when it's uh, oh yeah when it's for real sure clear because I cold. mean if you t- talk about spooky fish. What's the best way to catch spooky fish? Is with yeah the, with a fly. fly that, what's know? the best way to catch a fish? With a hook. <laughs> <laughs> or with a okay. net. Okay, <laughs> all right, <laughs> with a net. <laughs> with a net. There you go. Um, but yeah, I mean flies are a great way if you if you're into that um, to catch them in the winter. Just be in. in to me, it makes it a little more fun, especially just sight fishing in general. Yeah. If you can do it with a fly rod, if it's not blowing you know, yeah. 30 miles an hour or for sure. and you got someone to pull you around, then it's awesome. But I, I generally like a white fly mm-hmm. in the winter with a, that's a little shrimpy looking. Yeah, definitely. Um, that seems to be like candy to them in the winter for some reason. Yeah, I'd agree. It's the, the One of the other big things about the fly is like the presentation. Like if you can throw a fly well – you can really lay a nice long cast out there really quietly. I mean, if your fly line lands over top of them, you're done. But, you know, you got spooky fish, you tie a 12-foot leader on, and you can lay something out there real light and soft. And the other thing with, like Cameron's saying, like a small fly is is the sink rate. So when you mm-hmm. can, like, just let that fly kind of slowly fall down into their zone, you know, they might be floating on the surface, they might be laying on the bottom, and you can just kind of keep it in there, almost like a mirror lure. Like a mirror yeah. lure is another great bait in the winter on those oh, schools yeah. when they're yeah, kind of yeah. floating around or mid-water calm. Just something that kind of stays in front of them. They don't have to work very hard for it. It's just going to be right there in front of them, and they can just easily – it's a quick little easy meal. Hmm. Um, but, yeah, the, the, fly is, the fly is awesome. If, you're, if you have – the ability to throw the fly rod um, on those schools in the winter, that's that's probably the best time of year to do it. I mean, yeah. you can get lots of cool shots at fish. And we had a good day. Yeah, I remember cool. the, when we fished about, what, maybe a year and a half, two years, a year ago? I can't remember when it was. Uh, it was a, I don't remember. It was a, it was a tough day, but I think we, we got on a big school of fish at the yeah. end of the day. And, but I, we didn't even catch anything, I don't think. And we chased them. But, dude, it was blowing pretty it heavy. It was blowing really yeah. hard, yeah. So. But it, it's uh, this year's been good. If y'all get out there and you, and you look around hard, there, there's a lot of schools of redfish out there, and there's a lot of schools of redfish I'm sure I don't even know anything about. And so it's a good time of year to – You guys feel free to Instagram us if you do know where schools of redfish are. Yeah, let us know, <laughs> and we'll send you a hat. <laughs> Just remember, we've shown up consistently for 26 episodes. That's, that's payment. Tell us where those red drum are. <laughs> you can just drop us a pen, and we will see you there tomorrow. <laughs> But uh, oh, what was I gonna say? I just had another. Point. Sorry, dude. No, no, I, I'm good, like having good. fun. It's my no. last one. I gotta have. I gotta, gotta get all fun. of them out, right? I you gotta get all these fun. jokes out. So for sure, we uh, we should cut the uh, the sounds on on the soundboard. And oh, we, may, the maybe end. at the end. Maybe at the end, we could have some really good fun. <laughs> all right, uh, we tried to do it on Halloween, and I just got real nervous right when we went live. It's like cut it off. Oh um, man. But yeah, it's it's uh, what we were just talking about: fly fishing. Yep, lures to use lures to use so what so what about flies or i mean are you is there something in the winter that's just like your go-to like hey i'm going to start with this or is it kind of like match the hatch as everyone likes to say i'd I'd say my favorite soft plastic in the lure or soft plastic in the winter is a light jig head doesn't really matter with color i don't think yeah um that's like a translucent like blue or green for sure something that just looks like there's a lot of small fry around at that time and, um, yeah, you know, I think that's just what they're t- keyed in on. Yeah. I don't, I don't generally like like really bright colors. In yeah, the for sure. For sure. I, I'm with you. Dark colors. Uh, let me switch this over here. I'm struggling. There we go. Dark colors can, <laughs> I think uh, someone had to use the restroom. Billy's sliding out of here. Um, but, but yeah, so there we go. Um, dark colors can work well too, but yeah, that clear translucent, just kind of like the imitation of a fish there. It's not too aggressive can be, um, can be pretty, pretty, uh, you can slide back over Billy. Burn, burn. <laughs> you're good. We had to, we had to shut the door. Did somebody come in? Yeah. Was, I forgot to shut the door. So gotcha, my bad. Gotcha, gotcha. no, you're good. Um, but yeah, I, I think, uh, there, there's a couple different approaches when deciding what baits to throw and, and one, and one of the things you got to think about is color. The other thing is like, how are these fish reacting to your presentation? And, um, 
some days I like to throw a paddle tail, something that I can throw out there and just steadily retrieve through that school of fish. I'm not even really twitching it. It's just looking like a bait fish swimming. Um, and other days, you know, when they're a little bit deeper, when you can throw something like a trout trick or you can still do it with a paddle tail, but that you can just kind of bounce on the bottom and just jig on the bottom a little bit. Yeah. Some days that jig, that little kind of like head drag in the bottom mm -hmm. seems to get more bites. And other days when you can throw it through there and just reel it through that school um, is the best bet. And th yeah. there's – oh, go ahead. I was, I was gonna, just going to say, I don't, I don't think you can go wrong. I mean, paddle tails work. Yeah. Jerk shads work. Yep. DOA shrimps are always a good, you know, thing. Oh, yeah. I, mean, I mean, we all know that uh, redfish aren't super picky. Yeah. Um, they're a little bit more picky in the winter, I would say. But it's it's almost not so much about being picky in the winter. It's being picky about presentation yeah. in the winter. Definitely. Yeah, That that that's funny. That's what I was going to go into is that I think we should definitely touch on when you're fishing, I mean, this goes to, into fish in general, but how to present appropriately to to these fish. And so um, one thing that, that doesn't typically work, I mean, maybe if they're real fired up, but if you're throwing and, and bringing that bait directly at the fish, a lot of times they're not going to eat it. It could be 300 fish there, and if that bait's skipping through the water towards them, you'll watch them just kind of go around it. Yeah, no. Um, I mean, it's, it's tough because, like, when you see a school of fish, the – and you're like, and you have a good position boat, yeah. boat wise and you're like, Oh man, I need to throw them right now because they might disappear or whatever. But I mean, you really want like a cross angle, um, like the fish are coming at you and you throw, you know, either to their left and just bring it across them right as they're kind of swimming by kind of sweeping so, it. Yeah. Just swooping it across their face. Yeah. That, that's the ticket. Like if for they're sure. swimming away from you and you throw over them and start bringing it right towards them, generally that doesn't, I mean, it can work, yeah. but I, I would say hookup ratios on that are, are lower. Good. Yeah. If you do have to throw over them, it seems like the less movement you can do, the better. Yeah, just let them pick, pick let, it up. Yeah, off let the them pick it up off the bottom is, is to yeah. Okay. So are you trying to, are you guys trying to get in ahead of that school and cast and bring it like, like if, like if the school's coming at me, would I dip to the left or the right and try to cast and bring it through that way? Like drift it in front yeah, of them? Yeah, just kind of back like toward me. That's what you're saying. Face. Okay, yeah, gotcha. Like a retreating fish, so if you can throw it, like if, 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 if I'm looking, you know, at the school of fish and they're going to kind of come up past, my, if they're going to keep swimming, they're going to come past my right side. I'm going to throw across that path. Mm -hmm. And as they get there, I'm just going to swing that bait <laughs> through where it's just kind of sweeping at a, at a retreating yeah. angle across them. And, and one thing I was just think about this when you were talking about, you know, talking about all that was, um, you know, boat placement. One thing that's not good to do is bump these fish. Like, and bumping is what I refer to as like, if, if the school's swimming all nice and happy and all of a sudden they jolt and they swim away, I call that no, bumping gotcha. the fish. But if you can get in an area where you, you don't have to chase them back and forth, because, you know, if you can just sit up against a bank, a lot of times they just kind of swim laps in an area. Yeah. And so if you can pull off their path just far enough to where you can kind of see them when they're coming through, and make a cast in there and hook a fish off the edge and bring it to you. And that fish, that school doesn't really know you're there. That's typically the best, uh, best yeah. tactic. As yeah, far if, as... You, if you find a school and the, that school never sees the boat, you're generally going to catch more than one fish. Yeah. Gotcha. Yeah, yeah for sure. Um, we just had a question here. What's your spinning rod set up for small light baits? Um, a medium light rod in the winter, you can really get away with, I mean, uh, or just a medium, but I, I usually use a 2500. I've been actually using my trout rods and reels lately, which are little small Kunans, medium lights, and, and 2500 uh, Daiwa reels on them. And, and, and they work great. I mean, any I, I really bump that leader size down too in the winter. In the summer, I'll throw sometimes 30 pound, 25 pound, where I can horse those fish in. But in the wintertime, if, the, if I feel like they're being spooky or even before they're spooky, you just, you know, throw 12 to 15 pound fluorocarbon leader and, and you're good. You're good to go. Yeah. But yeah, you can get away even with a big redfish, like even a bull redfish. I ca I've caught plenty of bull redfish in Louisiana on very light rods and, mm -hmm. and they're, they're strong fish, but they, you can beat them pretty quickly. Like they're not yeah. going to run super hard. I always see these guys on the jetty fishing these really heavy duty rods, which I think is great. But they'll, you know, it'll be a big old beef stick that you could catch a grouper on and get it off the bottom. <laughs> and that's awesome. I think it's good to land fish quickly, but they'll hook like a shark or a ray and they're fighting it for like 15 minutes. And I don't want to break their hearts and be like, you know, that's, that's definitely not a redfish. <laughs> yeah. but, uh, yeah. but a redfish, you can get to the boat pretty darn quickly. So, yeah. yeah. Dude, um, those BGs, man, you brought that up. I've, I've gotten some albacore on those. Yeah. Yeah. I don't care. 
I just like, <laughs> I'm like, die, baby, die. That thing will not die. They I don't they care. Won't. They're solid. Doesn't They're a little matter. heavier reels than some other reels, but they are yeah. solid, man. They really are. What, what's your setup? What are you, what are you fishing? I use a medium light medium as well, light. pretty much for trout and redfish. Yeah. Um, but I, I, I just kind of have a mixed bag of rods and reels. For but, sure. Um, a grab bag, but, if yeah, you will. Yeah, a 2,500 to 3,000. Um, I use 15-pound braid on almost yep. all of my reels, whether that be trout or redfish. And um, I pretty much use, like, 15-pound liter, like, for everything. Yeah, 15 pound liter for everything. Yeah, yeah it's I me mean, for trout, for redfish. I mean, it just seems to be like I don't like carrying more stuff than I need. Yeah. So if I if 15 pound liter works for both of those species and generally that's what I'm targeting in the winter, you know, it, it works great. Yeah, definitely. It's uh 15 15 is probably all you really need through the summer too. I think guiding, I jump it up a little bit, you know, get people thrown on the oysters, don't up in the oh, grass, yeah, yeah. just have something a little oh, bit. Yeah. It's going to last a little bit that. longer, but yeah, 15 pounds plenty. I mean, especially if you, if you're fishing on a really stout rod, 15 pound, you're probably going to break on a hook set, but if you're fishing a medium light or a lighter rod, um, you really don't, you're really not going to, I mean, you can swing on those fish real hard and, and you're not going to break that 15 pound on the hook set. Um, but maybe you will, if you're, if you're like, uh, like Billy over here, he likes to really stick it to him. Hey man. <laughs> I've sent some uh, uh, sunfish out of ponds into the next zip code. <laughs> Fly fishing. That's why you fish barbless, yeah. so you can just rip them out of the water, fling them up on the bank, and you go pick them up at the end. Dude, know? yeah, the first time I ever went fly fishing, I sent a horny toad up in the mountains somewhere. Oh, yeah. 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 Oh, yeah. Brook trout. Brook trout do that, too. Oh, oh yeah. man. <laughs> Your little bobber goes down. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, but let, let, let me look through a few more questions here. You got any questions there, Billy, or, or Cameron? Anything you want to touch on, Cameron? Oh, here's a good one. Here, let's uh, best way to locate deeper holes besides darker water. I don't know if there is. I think that's kind of. Do you, can you think? Of yeah. I, so I mean, Google Earth. Um, I think that's what he's talking about. Probably. Oh yeah. For, yeah. Like uh, darker holes. I mean, that's that's always a good way to find them. Um, outside but, of bends too, and creeks, and like uh, yeah, outside, outside bends. Of, yeah, generally bends and creeks. I mean, but most like big creeks. I wouldn't say big creeks, but like medium-sized creeks at some point in them have a deep hole somewhere. Yeah. Um, so I, I don't know. You, it's almost just one of those things you just kind of have to explore. Yeah. You got to be willing to put in some time. You got to put on your fish goggles and jump, <laughs> jump in and start swimming. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I think they can see you not too well here. This must be a good spot. Honestly, and we talk about this a lot, Cameron and our buddy Jeff. It's like you sometimes you just need to commit some days to looking. And even if you find oh, yeah. fish, catch a fish or two, keep looking. Like if, if I was going to give you all one tip to take away from this show to go find some schools of winter redfish, it would be hop on Google Earth tonight when this episode's done. And after you, you, you go like it on Facebook and share it and uh, <laughs> hop on Google Earth and um, – Yep, just get on Google Earth. <laughs> I'm, I'm struggling tonight. It's been a Google long Earth is getting some promo tonight. <laughs> if you can't tell, Google Earth is paying us $100,000 a year to talk about that. Google Earth. And when I go fishing, I fish with Google Earth. <laughs> <laughs> but all jokes aside, oh, yeah. hop on Google. Google Earth. Get Google Earth. <laughs> pick, pick, pick an area, you know, maybe let's say a 20 mile stretch of the intercoastal waterway or 15 mile stretch of the intercoastal waterway. Go up and on Google Earth, go through all those little small creeks, mark, a, drop a pin on every dark green spot you see in the creeks, the dark, deep, deeper holes. And then next time you go and get on the water, go you go at like a falling or probably a rising tide's better. If you get out there at like a, a quarter of the way into the rise from a low tide and just start rolling through all these spots, checking them until you find a school of fish. I mean, don't, don't stop and work too hard until you see the fish. Yeah, I mean, definitely. Um, I would say... But, but I mean, it's just, I have spent way more days probably looking for fish than days where I've like been absolutely crushing it. Yeah. Oh yeah. Um, just because, I mean, you, you have to enjoy that part of it as well to, I feel like to be successful. Yeah. Um, because you can't like the, when I first started fishing, I would get like super frustrated because I'd be like, man, I see all these people they're catching fish all the time. It looks so easy, blah, blah, blah. And it uh it just takes time and yeah and you you start to enjoy that process of like okay there was a school here last year up oh, there's not a, you know no fish here this year right well let's spend the rest of the day you know just enjoying being out there and 
going up creeks looking for different definitely stuff you know it's, crack a cold beverage yeah that or a warm that beverage in the winter time. experience <laughs> <laughs> sometimes it does sometimes it, that's needed yeah I, dude when i started fishing salt water and, and i don't have a boat and so i'm not out there all the time but even when i was kayak fishing you know more so than i am now and or, or going fishing with people it was always you know because coming from the mountains you got a little stream of water typically. I mean, you can get on the South Holston River and it's pretty wide and you can go search for fish or whatever. But, you know, my father-in-law and I, we like to just go up in the mountains, mountains where you get a a stream is double the size of the, you know, double as wide as this room. So like 12, 16 feet or something. And you can really just like you're fishing. And then when I moved here, I'm like, dude, this is more like hunting. I'm trying to find like, where's the trail with the red fish, you know? And then, or like, or whatever. I'm like asking oh, a hundred signs. people. Yeah. Dead blue crabs. Yeah. I'm like, <laughs> yeah. yeah I'm They've like, been here. I'm like sniffing the mud. Like, <laughs> yeah. You're like tracking these red fish. That's what I kind of feel like. And I feel like a lot of people, cause there's some people are like, Oh wait, you know, we don't catch, we're trying to catch two fish. We don't 60 would just be like, we died with the heaven, you know? So, but pretty good. I mean, good information. Like if you're going to fish this area, fish the coast, enjoy the and enjoy the process yeah for with a sure. lot of stuff so for sure and, and, and it's there. not just creeks either you know it's these deeper areas the jetty think about deeper docks that you catch fish oh, yeah. on in the I mean, summer docks are a great place to fish in the winter i mean you have to you, you you won't be able to see them as well right um so you have to be willing to put in the time to blind cast a lot um and i would probably do cut trim yeah definitely if i'm fishing docks i don't know why they just yeah. I mean, you can get on them really good at docks where they're, like, really eating artificial as well. But I feel like if you're just solely searching for, like, a school of fish somewhere in the docks, just throw a cut shrimp. And, um, I mean, even if you don't find a school of redfish, you you can, you can catch a bunch of different stuff. Like yeah. We, we found a school, like, a, a, you can't eat, you couldn't even see them, but literally every cast, black drum. On, like, on docks? On docks. Yeah. Yeah, and it was just one dock. But, like, it was just, loaded. Yeah, absolutely loaded. If you yeah. drop us a pin on the Eastern Current DMs for $15, <laughs> uh, Cameron will share that dock with you. <laughs> I'm just oh, kidding. my gosh. Over my dead body. But <laughs> Here's my Cash App account. <laughs> that's, that's another thing. I'm going to go back to Google Earth because it's such an incredible tool for this. But you can find the deeper docks on Google Earth. And one thing that, that I didn't learn until about a year ago is you can scroll through. I think it's on the top left-hand corner different years of satellite images so you can find a year where the water is is a little bit cleaner or or i think that they, oh, they wow. update pictures quite often but if you can find some of those deeper docks and and like cameron's saying to carolina rig and some cut shrimp this time of year you're not going to get trash fished as much i mean there's still some trash fish around. yeah and, uh, well not so much i feel like the, i don't catch that many lizard fish this time of year. no they're they go off yeah, they're, it's cold. they're gone Oh um, man, I should go fishing then. That's yeah, right. all I catch. <laughs> and, and if you don't, um, if you're any anything like me, and I really, I mean, I, I enjoy fishing Carolina rig. I just hate rigging them for some reason because <laughs> I always seem to get them caught on something. Oh yeah. But you can always just get a, a heavier jig head and thread a you know a piece of shrimp on oh, there. Oh yeah, and for it sure. It works great. Yeah, they'll they'll eat the mess out of that. And yeah. I would say you know you've, you say you've marked out a bunch of docks or you've picked out an area you want to fish. Go pitch a uh, cut shrimp and and sit there for five minutes yeah if you don't I get a bite not, leave go yeah, go fish yeah, another dock they, they're gonna find it really time. quick in this clean water if they're there they're gonna find it really quickly yeah. so um we had another question come in uh where is it are the albies still here off topic but yes they're or no they're, they're not here they, they kind of showed up for a few days um about two or three weeks ago i'd actually i, I was going to get out there and, and try to look for them and just didn't get the opportunity to but i think they're probably gone for the for the winter, I mean, go yeah. off to go out of the Gulf Stream, and you can probably catch all you want. But they're they're not catch inshore. Them, they're not worth a sixty mile run. Isn't very much fun. <laughs> no. You're like, oh darn, another Albie. Um, what's the best way to find the creeks that you can walk in and not sink up to your neck? Don't fish the river. Yeah, the, anything <laughs> closer to freshwater yeah. is is definitely going to be a, a more of a pluff mud. Um, Google Earth. If you look on Google Earth uh, and, and those clean water pictures, a lot of times you can tell the difference in the color of the bottom. Yeah, I mean, if you if you're um, if you're seeing a lot of like white sand, yeah, like just light colored sand, generally that's going to be a harder bottom. Yeah, um, oh, okay. something something that you can walk in. I mean, it still might be a little, you might sink up to your shin or something like that. Yeah, it might be a little bit of a pain, but it's it's not something that you 
sink up to your waist in. No. Yeah. Do they got some special shoes like mud? You know, and they got those snow shoes. I definitely. Yeah, anybody would. got any mud shoes <laughs> out there? That that would be a, a like a smaller snowshoe. I think I just gave away my ticket. million dollar idea. <laughs> Dang it. The only problem would be stepping down would be fine, but then when you try to lift your foot back up out of the water, it's all have stuck. To, have to yeah. Quick release. You know, like let the water drain through like a mesh or something like that. Yeah, I mean, I just <laughs> have those. Um, I have those like pretty high extra tufts. Yep. Those seem to work pretty good. Yeah, those are yeah. those will work great. There's a lot of companies that make wading wading shoes too. Yeah, and, and you slip can wear, right out of the mud. Yeah, you can. Well, the mud, it's like there's no way around the mud. That's really. a good. That's good information. And light color is maybe a little harder ground. I know that sounds so dumb, but I went with, you know, Daniel Fisher. Yep. Yep. He's like the outdoor guy. So last winter, we were like, oh, we're just gonna go and see if we can find it. when you could kill a flounder and go see if we can find one. And dude, he's like. 40 pounds lighter than I am so he's looks like treading on this mud dude I was like sunk up to my hip I'm like oh god I'm gonna die and it was like midnight Quicksand. I'm like I'm like Daniel come back come back he's like what man I'm, and he's like oh god you're stuck and I'm like yeah I'm like up to my you know whatever I won't oh, say man. but dude it was terrible so I'm gonna go on Google Earth and try to find the hard stuff for sure and but, just yeah. as locally I can't speak you know all, all across the board but from Wrightsville Beach from the Wrightsville Beach Bridge let's say let's say from Mason Bro Inlet up to surf uh south topsail maybe a little north of south topsail like slew point boat ramp i would say all that's for the most part pretty hard sand the closer you get to freshwater influence the better of a chance you're going to have soft bottom and that goes you know all that stuff out in the marsh is pretty sandy and mm-hmm. granted there are going to be some muddier areas but then you, in that same zone if you go into those western creeks that kick back into the inland those are going to be real soft mud back in the back hmm. so you know the more the the sandier stuff's going to be closer to the inlets closer where the the oceans in, in, are interfering with not interfering but interacting with that marsh yeah so if it's got more of a river influence it's going to be much more muddy it seems just changed my so, like, life you get down to south carolina where there's a lot of rivers coming in it's so much bluff mud way more bluff mud than we have here and, and the cape fear is all bluff mud and louisiana is like you get the one mississippi river coming in and it is literally silt for miles on either i mean i just feel like it. louisiana is not a place i'm getting out of the boat to fish no you, you don't want to unless you're standing on like on the marsh grass or something like that yeah but, yeah. yeah it's uh you really can't do much wading there yeah, it doesn't, doesn't seem good. <laughs> but uh, let's uh, find a lot of fish on that dark mud when the sun warms. Yeah, that's a good point, Tommy. So Tommy Mungo just said um, how that dark mud will warm up quicker than the than the sand will. You know, it's going to pull that heat from the sun a little bit better. Same deal with the oysters. And uh, it, those fish like that in the winter. The, the bait's going to hold in there. Those fish are going to target in there. And someone else had mentioned earlier, <laughs> which was a good point, that the uh, the – the fish will get in these holes too, where the water on these flats is getting warmed up. And then as that tide drops, it's kind of pulling that warmer water down into that hole. So um, that's one thing to think about. What was the next <laughs> question that came in there? John says, hey, will Sito come and get you when you're stuck way back in the creek in five inches of water? I'm going to probably say, call Sito Scott and ask him. <laughs> yeah, I might have to ask him. That. I, I don't want to speak on his behalf. That's a good default. You better hope that there's a school of fish back there or else yeah. you're going to be pretty poor. <laughs> Make sure. sure you pack a lunch. For sure. Yeah, you should do one episode I'll request that you do is a uh, fisherman's survival kit when you go out there and get stuck in the mud like that. That it's is. Called, it's called beer. It's <laughs> whiskey <laughs> you make sure you take your whiskey you'll well, be fine do, can y'all think of any more we're we're getting right to an hour here is there anything else that, that any questions that y'all have or any any especially on the feed if you got any more questions shoot them in we'll answer them real quick and uh can you think of anything else off the top of your head to talk about no i mean i would just say um i mean we touched on it earlier that because these fish are like super schooled up for the most part they're going to be harder to find um, yeah. So you have to put in a lot of time looking for them, and hopefully you can find some. And when you do, um, d- generally they'll they'll be there for a while. So you'll have a you'll have a spot to go and catch fish each, each weekend. And but hopefully you, you find multiple spots like that. So you, it's always fun to have like multiple schools that you know of because oh we can hit this school you know at low tide they're biting good at low tide and then we can go north or south and hit this school in the mid tide. Yeah. I mean that's pretty much you have two or three of those and you got yourself a yeah and you can tie it with some trout fishing, fishing too and, yeah. and really yeah. fill it out so which is pretty hot right now yeah it's been good. It's, good it's getting a little more difficult like the you know one day you might catch them in a spot and the next day they're not there but um 
So trout are a little more feisty, a little more moving than red drum this time of year, you think? More susceptible to weather. I think they're pushed around um, more due to the front and the changing temperatures no, um, than, than the redfish are. And the redfish are as well, but but maybe not as not as like, you know, spot to spot. It's like the ocean or the creeks or the near shore wrecks or the inlets kind of. Yeah, a lot of times I'm, I'll be trout fishing a spot like the next day. And the... <laughs> You could have caught like ten or fifteen there the day before, and then you go back there, and they're they're not biting at all. And yeah. it's like, man, did they move, or are they just like not eating? Yeah, Tommy Mungo said a hundred percent of the fish and one percent of the water, which is which is a good point. Um, we have one more That's question come in from from John. It says, "What's the absolute slowest month in our area?" Actually, we had two questions. We had one from Andrew as well. I would say. February. Well, golly, it's tough. Oh, I've had some not. excellent days in February. I always just think it's the transition periods. Yeah. Like late not, spring can not, be pretty yeah, tough. Yeah, not so much uh yes. Yes. Late That's spring. I was, I, I was gonna say not um not winter to spring. I feel like winter to spring is a good transition, but late uh late spring can be tough. Yeah. Yeah, late spring can be real tough. It's because like, it's just like just right when they're kind of all breaking up and they just they kind, of, they kind of just disappear. It feels like a lot of them go back to the ocean for a little bit. Yeah. Maybe they go to the head of the ocean. I mean, I don't know. I don't have any trackers. I don't have trackers on many of them yet, but um, <laughs> I'm just kidding. But, but it's, uh, yeah, that's a, that's, I'd say that's it's my another, toughest. That's another million dollar. Idea. Like April. April's pretty brutal sometimes because they're not into their summer patterns yet. They're not really doing their winter thing anymore. And you feel like, holy crap, all our fish are gone. And all of a sudden, you know, you start seeing them break into their summer patterns. Um, here is. I'll, I'll read both these questions. It's what's the absolute that I just read that one. How far up the river are you going this time of year um, and finding reds? And then um, is the river ICW more product, productive in the winter? Anyone, anyone went way back up in the river and had any luck. Okay. You can hit this. I okay. So the river that much. the, the river, I mean, you guys will catch redfish way up in the river all winter long. Um, I don't do much fishing, you know, up, up in the, these coastal rivers, but the Cape Fear, I feel like, is just as solid of a fishery as as the stuff along the intercoastal waterway. It's just a matter of, just like we were saying, just getting out there and checking a lot of stuff and figuring out where these fish are. Because um, another thing, too, we didn't even touch on this. If they're there in a spot at a certain time of year, one year, they're probably going to be there the next year. So think back on years past and, like, month. That's why it's an important thing to keep a log, and that's a whole other episode. But look back and, and, and look at pictures, maybe dated pictures and be like, okay, these fish were in this area this time, you know, in, in January. And, and usually they'll be there again, at least some of them or more of them. So, um, I, I couldn't say one's better than the other. They're honestly both, you know, solid choices. It's just a matter of covering water and figuring out where the fish are hanging out in those zones. So that's not the best answer for that, but well, you it's fished the, truth. the new river, not too long ago. And you, you caught a mixed bag of red, of trout, uh, yeah, we caught rockfish and redfish. That was uh, Cape Fear, Cape oh, Fear River. Okay. Yeah, 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 yeah. The Cape Fear River. We had a mixed bag of um, redfish, trout, and and striper. So yeah, I mean, there, there's a lot to do this time of year. Like people, you, a lot of people, you know, they're just focusing on trout. When the trout die off, you know, they're kind of done for the winter. But get on those redfish, find those striper. That's a whole other. That'd be a great episode to do as well. A striper episode. Yeah, I was gonna say, that. man, that winter striper bite. When's yeah. that when's that hit in? It's it's on right now. I mean, we had a big fish kill from the hurricane, but mm. but there's still fish out there. We caught some fish the other day and I talked to my buddy John Huff um yesterday and they were in the river and caught a good number of striper. You're nothing big, you know, I think sixteen to eighteen was probably their biggest fish, but um th there's a lot to do. But yeah, the, I, I would say, you know, whatever you're more confident in, whatever you know where some more fish are in the summer, go start looking in those same zones, checking the deep holes around those areas where you catch fish regularly in the summertime is your best bet would, would be my answer so yeah man you have some action on that striper fish everybody wants an episode can we do this oh there we go yeah maybe we'll have to we might have to bring old uh john huff on to talk about striper old johnny boy old johnny boy that's his rod building business have you talked to him about that i think he's doing, doing good. good yeah he's got his little shop set up now and uh i think he's rocking and rolling so yeah if sweet. you need custom rods check out uh check out john huff circle h charters this is his website do you guys Circle's guide in striper fest um, I do. Yep. Yep, I do. Boom. Book it. Don't wait. <laughs> He's going to get booked. I'm going to book it if you don't. 
Yeah, it's a thousand John. bucks if anybody wants to fish with me. If you if you want to get two people together and come fish with me, a thousand bones. Does Thou- that, thousand does, bones. Does that include the buy-in for the tournament and all that stuff? Yeah, that's the buy. That's not what I'm charging. That's what they charge. Oh, that's what they. Yeah, charge. that's what they charge. So a thousand bucks to to and fish. And then the plus tournament. whatever your fee mm-hmm. is to take them. No, no, I, if, I, I'm just going to fish the tournament either way. So if you pay the thousand oh. bucks and want to fish it, I'm, I'll fish it with you. So oh, it's a cool. captain's invite tournament and. Um, they they'll they'll they have a bunch of people reach out to them that want to fish it that pay the entry fee. Uh, gotcha. Um, but if someone on here, if we want to do an Eastern Current team, if somebody wants to sponsor it or pay to go, let's do it. That'd be fun. Be a lot of fun. Yeah, that'd be awesome. So I'm leaving at the wrong time. What the crap? I know, man. I, know. I should be doing some striper fest. I would be terrible anyway. You guys would be like, please throw this guy overboard. It's gonna be a hustle this year. I know <laughs> last like, year was tough. Yeah. So John Huff will probably yeah. win that. I saw the trophies all in his office that one time all the striper t- tournaments yeah i got i've got one I need to get another one so go get one man i'm gonna try to this one well guys thank y'all so much for tuning in billy we're gonna miss you like crazy oh man cameron you did all right <laughs> there's room for improvement um, man just calling you out right on the air right in front of the audience oh, no. live audience you did all right wow. i'm just kidding no you did awesome i'm looking forward to it and we're looking forward to have you back on yeah man a lot billy billy really was so crucial in building the show i mean we, we would not be where we were without Billy and he's done so much incredible back end work setting up this ecam live that we shoot this on j- trying to teach me how to do it I'm like uh I have an affiliate link no <laughs> I'm just kidding I'm always trying to sell something he does have an affiliate link so I do if you, but if you purchase ecam live Billy gets a little dough yeah man and so we're going to do some you know we're going to do some of that stuff too if people want to do I've had a couple people reach out to me about you know doing doing a podcast of their own and wanting some some guidance in that, yeah. so that's a that's a service that I, I you know I'd be willing. Haven't offered that, but I would be willing to able and willing, you know, willing and able. to uh, to do that as well. So if there's anybody that's like, oh man, I think I want to do a podcast or whatever. I mean, if you want to do a fishing podcast, it's probably going to cost a lot more than just a normal old podcast. But you know, for sure, because because I'd be competing against a brand I helped start, so I wouldn't. Yeah, be super we would happy, take you but... down. We would literally crush you. I'm just kidding. <laughs> oh, well, so I'm going to be starting a fishing podcast next week. No, it's going to be called Keystern Current. Keystern Current. It's going oh. to be called. It's going to be called. Uh, never mind. I'm just going to move on. <laughs> uh, so anyway, man. Yeah, really appreciate it, man. It's been super fun. It's Obviously, it's not the last time I'll be on here. The last time and you're going to come so on the business think. podcast and and do some stuff there and talk about your your business and building yeah. that guide business and things like that as well. So, um, but yeah, man. For everybody listening or watching, keep up with me. Go follow me at Thorpe Creative on Instagram. Uh, go check out Thorpe Creative Entrepreneur Podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, Twitcher, wherever Twitcher. podcasts are. Uh, Google Play, all those places. So. For sure. Yeah, man. It's going to be fun. And what do I do to end this? Do I press the finish button? Yeah, press the... the is that it say finish it on there? It already says finish on there. Yeah, you just press the finish button and then it'll say end. And then you've got it. <laughs> As y'all can see, I've got a long way to go. So hopefully we'll be live next week. Dude, you'll be fun. <laughs> hey, worst case scenario, you sit in front of your computer and just hit Facebook Live. That's true. <laughs> we'll have uh, Billy on the phone. All right, Billy, what do we do next? So, but yeah, we, we appreciate you, Billy. I know everyone here appreciates you. A lot of people are going to miss you. And we'll definitely be having him back on. And if you like Billy, like I said, go check out his podcast. And if you have a small business or you know you started a business and um, you know what you want to do a podcast with Billy, reach out to him because he, he's that's what he's going to be doing is interviewing a bunch of business owners and yeah, entrepreneurs and, and whatnot. And There's so, a lot of power in content marketing there for is. a small business. There definitely is. So cool. So, well, cool. Appreciate well, it, man. As always, this is Eastern Current, and we're going to hug off camera. What do they, <laughs> what, what do they say on uh, Anchorman when when he? At, Stay classy. <laughs> <laughs> stay classy. As all, and as always, this is Eastern Current. Please. And stay classy, Greater Wilmington area. <laughs> <laughs>